Chapter Eleven. What I heard in the apple barrel. No, not I," said Silver. "Flint was captain. I was quartermaster along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men. That was. And come to changing names to their ships, Royal Fortune, and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay. I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Walrus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen amuck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah. Cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man too, by all accounts," said Silver. "I never sailed along of him. First with England, then with Flint. That's my story. And now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking, I laid by nine hundred safe from England and two thousand after Flint." That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank. Tain't earnin' now. It's savin' does it. You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most on 'em aboard here, and glad to get the duff. Been beggin' before that, some on 'em. Old Pew has had lost his sight, and might have thought shame spends twelve hundred pound in a year. Like a lord in Parliament, where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two year before that, shiver my timbers! The man was starvin'. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all," said the young seaman. "Tain't much use for fools. You may lay to it that or nothin'," cried Silver. But now you look here. You're young, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think, if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on. Little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now, the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to sea again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark ye. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime, never denied myself a nothin' heart desires. And slept soft and ain't dainty all my days, but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other. But all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? Asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were. Said the cook, "It were when we weighed anchor, but my old missus has it all by now, and the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and riggin, and the old girl's off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust you, but it'd make jealousy among the mates. And can you trust your missus?" asked the other. "Gentlemen of fortune," returned the cook. 
usually trust little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me, I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John. There were some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint, but Flint his own self was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have feared to go to sea with them. Well, now, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself an old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John, but there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart, too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clap my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate, and the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. "'Dick's square,' said Silver. "'Oh, I know Dick was square,' returned the voice of the coxswain, Israel Hands. "'He's no fool, is Dick?' And he turned his quid and spat. "'But look here,' he went on. "'Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we a going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough, by thunder. I want to go into the cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. "'Israel,' said Silver, "'your head ain't much account, nor ever was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. Leastways your ears is big enough. Now—' Here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word, and you may lay to that, my son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is when. That's what I say. When? By the powers! cried Silver. Well, now— if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff— and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. "'Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think,' said the lad Dick. "'We're all forecastle hands, you mean,' snapped Silver. "'We can steer a course, but who's to set one?' That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island, as soon's the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk." "'Split my sides! I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you!' "'Easy all, Long John!' cried Israel. "'Who's a crossin' of you?' "'Why, how many tall ships, think you now, have I seen laid aboard? "'And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock?' cried Silver. "'And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry! "'You hear me?' 
I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would only lay your course and a pint to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have your mouth full of rum tomorrow, and go hang. Everybody knowed you was a kind of a chapling, John. But there's others as good hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, nohow, but took their fling, like jolly companions every one. So, says Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggarman. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was. Only, where are they? But, asked Dick, when do we lay em athwart, and what are we to do with em anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put em ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut em down like that much pork? That would have been Flint's, or Billy Bones's. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short on it now. And if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver. Rough and ready. But mark you here, I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you. But this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say. But when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick, he added, breaking off, you just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leaped out and run for it if I had found the strength. But my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise. And then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, "'Oh, stow that! Don't you get suckin' of that bilge, John! Let's have a go of the rum!' "'Dick,' said Silver, "'I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up.' Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them'll join. Hence there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one to luck, another with a here's to old Flint, and Silver himself sang, in a kind of song, Here's to ourselves, and hold your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen, and was silvering the mizzen-top, and shining white on the luff of the foresail. And almost at the same time the voice of the lookout shouted, Land ho! End of chapter.